out of the silent planet. By C.S. Lewis Read for you today by Hugh Carr Five. The period spent in the spaceship ought to have been one of terror and anxiety for Ransom. He was separated by an astronomical distance from every member of the human race, except two whom he had excellent reasons for distrusting. He was heading for an unknown destination and was being brought thither for a purpose which his captors steadily refused to disclose. Divine and Weston relieved each other regularly in a room which Ransom was never allowed to enter and where he supposed the controls of their machine must be. Weston, during his watches off, was almost entirely silent. Divine was more loquacious and would often talk and guffaw with the prisoner until Weston rapped on the wall of the control room and warned them not to waste air. But Divine was secretive after a certain point. He was quite ready to laugh at Weston's solemn scientific idealism. He didn't give a damn, he said, for the future of the species or the meeting of two worlds. There's more to Melacandra than that, he would add with a wink. But when Ransom asked him what more, he would lapse into satire and make ironical remarks about the white man's burden and the blessings of civilization. It is inhabited, then, Ransom would press. Ah, uh, there's always native question in these things, Divine would answer. For the most part, his conversation ran on the things he would do when he got back to Earth. Ocean-going yachts, the most expensive women, and a big place on the Riviera figured largely in his plans. I'm not running all these risks for fun. Direct questions about Ransom's own role were usually met with silence. Once only in reply to such a question, Divine, who was then, in Ransom's opinion, very far from sober, admitted that they were rather handing him the baby. But I'm sure, he added, you'll live up to the old school tie. All this, as I have said, was sufficiently disquieting. The odd thing was that it did not really greatly disquiet him. It is hard for a man to brood on the future when he is feeling so extremely well as Ransom now felt. There was an endless night on one side of the ship, and an endless day on the other. Each was marvellous, and he moved from the one to the other at his will, delighted. In the nights, which he could create by turning the handle of a door, he lay for hours in contemplation of the skylight. The Earth's disk was nowhere to be seen. The stars, thick as daisies on an uncut lawn, reigned perpetually with no cloud, no moon, no sunrise, to dispute their sway. There were planets of unbelievable majesty, and constellations undreamed of. There were celestial sapphires, rubies, emeralds, and pinpricks of burning gold. Far out on the left of the picture hung a comet, tiny and remote. And between all and behind all, far more emphatic and palpable than it showed on Earth, the undimensioned, enigmatic blackness. The lights trembled. They seemed to grow brighter as he looked. Stretched naked on his bed, a second Dana, he found it night by night more difficult to disbelieve in old astrology. Almost he felt holy, he imagined, sweet influence pouring or even stabbing into his surrendered body. 
all was silence, but for the irregular tinkling noises. He knew now that these were made by meteorites, small drifting particles of the world stuff that smote continually on their hollow drum of steel, and he guessed that at any moment they might meet something large enough to make meteorites of ship and all. But he could not fear. He now felt that Weston had justly called him little-minded at the moment of his first panic. The adventure was too high, in circumstance too solemn, for any emotion save a severe delight. But the days, that is, the hours spent in the sunward hemisphere of their microcosm, were the best of all. Often he rose after only a few hours' sleep to return drawn by an irresistible attraction to the regions of light. He could not cease to wonder at the noon which always awaited you, however early you were to seek it. There, totally immersed in a bath of pure ethereal colour and of unrelenting though unwounding brightness, stretched his full length, and with eyes half-closed in the strange chariot that bore them, faintly quivering, through depth after depth of tranquillity far above the reach of night, he felt his body and mind daily rubbed and scoured and filled with new vitality. Weston, in one of his brief, reluctant answers, admitted a scientific basis for these sensations. They were receiving, he said, many rays that never penetrated the terrestrial atmosphere. But Ransom, as time wore on, became aware of another and more spiritual cause for his progressive lightness and exaltation of heart, a nightmare long engendered in the modern mind by the mythology that follows in the wake of science, was falling off him. He had read of spades. At the back of his thinking for years had lurked the dismal fancy of the black, cold vacuity, the utter deadness, which was supposed to separate the worlds. He had not known how much it affected him until now. Now that the very name space seemed a blasphemous libel for this Empyrean ocean of radiance in which they swam. He could not call it dead. He felt life pouring into him from it every moment. How indeed should it be otherwise, since out of this ocean the worlds and all their life had come? He had thought it barren. He saw now that it was the womb of worlds, whose blazing and innumerable offspring looked down nightly even upon the earth with so many eyes, and here with how many more? No, space was the wrong name. Older thinkers had been wiser when they named it simply the heavens. The heavens which declared the glory the happy climes that lie where day never shuts his eye up in the broad fields of the sky. He quoted Milton's words to himself lovingly at this time and often. He did not, of course, spend all his time in basking. He explored the ship, so far as he was allowed, passing from room to room, with those slow movements which Weston enjoined upon them, lest exertion should overtax their supply of air. From the necessity of its shape, the spaceship contained a good many more chambers than were in regular use, but Ransom was also inclined to think that its owners, or at least Divine, intended these to be filled with cargo of some kind on the return voyage. He also became, by an insensible process, the steward and cook of the company, partly because he felt it natural to share the only labours he could share, he was never allowed into the control room, and partly in order to anticipate a tendency which Weston showed to make him a servant, whether he would or not. 
he preferred to work as a volunteer rather than in admitted slavery, and he liked his own cooking a good deal more than that of his companions. It was these duties that made him at first the unwilling and then the alarmed hearer of a conversation which occurred about a fortnight, he judged, after the beginning of their voyage. He had washed up the remains of their evening meal, basked in the sunlight, chatted with Divine, better company than West, and though in Ransom's opinion much the more odious of the two, and retired to bed at his usual time. He was a little restless, and after an hour or so it occurred to him that he had forgotten one or two small arrangements in the galley which would facilitate his work in the morning. The galley opened off the saloon or day-room, and its door was close to that of the control-room. He rose and went there at once. His feet, like the rest of him, were bare. The galley skylight was on the dark side of the ship, but Ransom did not turn on the light. To leave the door ajar was sufficient, as this admitted a stream of brilliant sunlight. As everyone who has kept house will understand, he found that his preparations for the morning had been even more incomplete than he supposed. He did his work well from practice and therefore quietly. He had just finished and was drying his hands on the roller towel behind the galley door when he heard the door of the control room open and saw the silhouette of a man outside the galley, Divine's, he gathered. Divine did not come forward into the saloon, but remained standing and talking, apparently into the control room. It thus came about that while Ransom could hear distinctly what Divine said, he could not make out Weston's answers. I think it would be damn silly, said Divine. If we could make sure of meeting the brutes where we might alight, there might be something in it. But suppose we have to trek. All we'd gain by your plan would be having to carry a drugged man in his pack instead of letting a live man walk with us and do his share of the work. Weston apparently replied, But he can't find out, returned Divine, unless someone is fool enough to tell him. Anyway, even if he suspects, do you think a man like that would have the guts to run away on a strange planet? Without food, without weapons? You'll find he'll eat out of your hand at the first sight of a sawn. Again, Ransom heard the indistinct noise of Weston's voice. How should I know? said Divine. It may be some sort of chief. Much more likely a mumbo-jumbo. This time came a very short utterance from the control room, apparently a question. Divine answered at once. It would explain why he was wanted. Weston asked him something more. Human sacrifice, I suppose. At least it wouldn't be human from their point of view. You know what I mean. Weston had a good deal to say this time and it elicited Divine's characteristic chuckle. Quite, quite, he said. It is understood that you are doing it all from the highest motives. So long as they lead to the same actions as my motives, you're quite welcome to them. Weston continued, and this time Divine seemed to interrupt him. You're not losing your nerve, are you? He said. He was then silent for some time, as if listening. Finally, he replied, If you're so fond of the brutes as that, you'd better stay and interbreed, if they have sexes which we don't yet know. Don't you worry, when the time comes for cleaning the place up, we'll save one or two for you, and you can keep them as pets, or vivisect them, or sleep with them, or all three. Whichever way it takes you. Yes, I know. Perfectly loathsome. I was only joking. Good night. A moment later, Divine closed the door of the control room, crossed the saloon and entered his own cabin. 
Ransom heard him bolt the door of it according to his invariable, though puzzling, custom. The tension with which he had been listening relaxed. He found that he had been holding his breath and breathed deeply again. Then, cautiously, he stepped out into the saloon. Though he knew that it would be prudent to return to his bed as quickly as possible, he found himself standing still in the now familiar glory of the light, and viewing it with a new and poignant emotion. Out of this heaven, these happy climbs, they were presently to descend into what? Sorns, human sacrifice, loathsome, sexless monsters. What was a sorn? His own role in the affair was now clear enough. Somebody or something had sent for him. It could hardly be for him personally. The somebody wanted a victim, any victim from Earth. He had been picked because Divine had done the picking. He realized for the first time, in all circumstances a late and startling discovery, that Divine had hated him all these years, as heartily as he hated Divine. But what was a sorn? When he saw them, he would eat out of Weston's hands. His mind, like so many minds of his generation, was richly furnished with bogies. He had read his H.G. Wells and others. His universe was peopled with horrors such as ancient and medieval mythology could hardly rival. No insect-like vermiculate or crustacean abominable, no twitching feelers, rasping wings, slimy coils, curling tentacles, no monstrous union of superhuman intelligence and insatiable cruelty seemed to him anything but likely on an alien world. The Sorns would be... would be... He dared not think what the Sorns would be and he was to be given to them. Somehow this seemed more horrible than being caught by them, given, handed over, offered. He saw in imagination various incompatible monstrosities, bulbous eyes, grinning jaws, horns, stings, mandibles, loathing of insects, loathing of snakes, loathing of things that squashed and squelched. All played their horrible symphonies upon his nerves, but the reality would be worse. It would be an extraterrestrial otherness, something one had never thought of, never could have thought of. In that moment Ransom made a decision. He could face death, but not the Sorns. He must escape when they got to Alicandra, if there were any possibility. Starvation, or even to be chased by Sorns, would be better than being handed over. If escape were impossible, then it must be suicide. Ransom was a pious man. He hoped he would be forgiven. It was no more in his power, he thought, to decide otherwise than to grow a new limb. Without hesitation, he stole back into the galley and secured the sharpest knife. Henceforward, he determined never to be parted from it. Such was the exhaustion produced by terror that when he regained his bed, he fell instantly into stupefied and dreamless sleep. 6. He woke much refreshed and even a little ashamed of his terror on the previous night. The situation was no doubt very serious. Indeed, the possibility of returning alive to Earth must be almost discounted. But death could be faced, and rational fear of death could be mastered. It was only the irrational, the biological horror of monsters that was the real difficulty. And this he faced and came to terms with as well as he could while he lay in the sunlight after breakfast. He had the feeling that one sailing in the heavens, as he was doing, should not suffer abject dismay before any earth-bound creature. He even reflected 
that the knife could pierce other flesh as well as his own. The bellicose mood was a very rare one with Ransom. Like many men of his own age, he rather underestimated than overestimated his own courage. The gap between boyhood dreams and his actual experience of the war had been startling, and his subsequent view of his own unheroic qualities had perhaps swung too far in the opposite direction. He had some anxiety lest the firmness of his present mood should prove a short-lived illusion, but he must make the best of it. As hour followed hour and waking followed sleep in their eternal day, he became aware of a gradual change. The temperature was slowly falling. They resumed clothes. Later, they added warm underclothes. Later still, an electric heater was turned on in the center of the ship, and it became certain too, though the phenomenon was hard to seize, that the light was less overwhelming than it had been at the beginning of the voyage. It became certain to the comparing intellect, but it was difficult to feel what was happening as a diminution of light, and impossible to think of it as darkening, because while the radiance changed in degree, its unearthly quality had remained exactly the same since the moment he first beheld it. It was not like fading light upon the earth, mixed with the increasing moisture and phantom colours of the air. You might halve its intensity, Ransom perceived, and the remaining half would still be what the whole had been, merely less, not other, Half it again, and the residue would still be the same. As long as it was at all, it would be itself. Out even to that unimagined distance where its last force was spent. He tried to explain what he meant to Divine. Like thingamy's soup, grinned Divine. Pure to the last bubble, eh? Shortly after this, the even tenor of their life in the spaceship began to be disturbed. Weston explained that they would soon begin to feel the gravitational pull of Malacandra. That means, he said, that it will no longer be down to the center of the ship. It will be down towards Malacandra, which from our point of view will be under the control room. As a consequence, the floors of most of the chambers will become wall or roof, and one of the walls a floor. You won't like it. The result of this announcement, so far as Ransom was concerned, was hours of heavy labour in which he worked shoulder to shoulder, now with Divine and now with Weston, as their alternating watches liberated them from the control room. Water tins oxygen cylinders, guns, ammunition and foodstuffs, had all to be piled on the floors alongside the appropriate walls, and lying on their sides so as to be upright when the new downwards came into play. Long before the work was finished, disturbing sensations began. At first Ransom supposed that it was the toil itself which so weighed his limbs, but rest did not elevate the symptom and it was explained to him that their bodies, in response to the planet that had caught them in its field, were actually gaining weight every minute and doubling in weight with every twenty-four hours. They had the experiences of a pregnant woman, but magnified almost beyond endurance. At the same time, their sense of direction, never very confident on the spaceship, became continuously confused. From any room on board, the next room's floor had always looked downhill and felt level. Now it looked downhill and felt a little, a very little downhill as well. One found oneself running as one entered it. A cushion flung aside on the floor of the saloon would be found hours later to have moved an inch or so towards the wall. All of them were afflicted with vomiting, headache, and palpitations of the heart. The conditions grew worse hour by hour. Soon one could only grope and crawl from cabin to cabin. All sense of direction disappeared in a sickening confusion. 
Parts of the ship were definitely below in the sense that their floors were upside down, and only a fly could walk on them, but no part seemed to Ransom to be indisputably the right way up. Sensations of intolerable height and of falling, utterly absent in the heavens, reoccurred constantly. Cooking, of course, had long since been abandoned. Food was snatched as best they could, and drinking presented great difficulties. You could never be sure that you were really holding your mouth below rather than beside the bottle. Weston grew grimmer and more silent than ever. Divine, a flask of spirits ever in his hand, flung out strange blasphemies and coprologies and cursed Weston for bringing them. Ransom ached, licked his dry lips, nursed his bruised limbs, and prayed for the end. The time came when one side of the sphere was unmistakably down. Clamp beds and tables hung useless and ridiculous on what was now wall or roof. What had been doors became trapdoors, opened with difficulty. Their bodies seemed made of lead. There was no more work to be done when Divine had set out the clothes, their malacandran clothes, from their bundles, and squatted down on the end wall of the saloon, now its floor, to watch the thermometer. The clothes, Ransom noticed, included heavy woolen underwear, sheepskin jerkins, fur gloves, and eared caps. Divine made no reply to his questions. He was engaged in studying the thermometer and in shouting down to Weston in the control room. Slower! Slower! He kept shouting. Slower, you damn fool! We'll be in the air in a minute or two! Then, sharply and angrily, Here! Let me get at it! Weston made no replies. It was unlike Divine to waste his advice. Ransom concluded that the man was almost out of his senses, whether with fear or excitement. Suddenly, the lights of the universe seemed to be turned down, as if some demon had rubbed the heaven's face with a dirty sponge. The splendor in which they had lived for so long blenched to a pallid, cheerless, and pitiable gray. It was impossible from where they sat to open the shutters or roll back the heavy blind. What had been a chariot gliding in the fields of heaven became a dark steel box dimly lighted by a slit of a window and falling. They were falling out of the heaven into a world. Nothing in all his adventures bit so deeply into Ransom's mind as this. He wondered how he could ever have thought of planets, even of the Earth, as islands of life and reality floating in a deadly void. Now, with a certainty which never after deserted him, he saw the planets, the Earths he called them in his thought, as mere holes or gaps in the living heaven excluded and rejected wastes of heavy matter and murky air, formed not by addition to, but by subtraction from the surrounding brightness. And yet, he thought, beyond the solar system, the brightness ends. Is that the real void, the real death? Unless he groped for the idea, unless visible light is also a hole or gap, a mere diminution of something else, something that is to bright, unchanging heaven as heaven is to the dark, heavy earths. Things do not always happen as a man would expect. The moment of his arrival in an unknown world found Ransom wholly absorbed in a philosophical speculation. 7. Having a doze, said Divine. A bit blasé about new plants by now. Can you see anything? interrupted Weston. I can't manage the shutters, damn them, returned Divine. We may as well get to the manhole. Ransom awoke from his brown study. The two partners were working together close beside him in the semi-darkness. He was cold, and his body, though in fact much lighter than on earth, still felt intolerably heavy. 
but a vivid sense of his situation returned to him. Some fear, but more curiosity. It might mean death, but what a scaffold. Already cold air was coming in from without, and light. He moved his head impatiently to catch some glimpse between the laboring shoulders of the two men. A moment later, the last nut was unscrewed. He was looking out through the manhole. Naturally enough, all he saw was the ground, a circle of pale pink, almost of white, whether very close and short vegetation, or very wrinkled and granulated rock or soil, he could not say. Instantly the dark shape of Divine filled the aperture, and Ransom had time to notice that he had a revolver in his hand. For me, or for Sorns, or for both, he wondered. You next! said Weston curtly. Ransom took a deep breath, and his hand went to the knife beneath his belt. Then he got his head and shoulders through the manhole, his two hands on the soil of Malacandra. The pink stuff was soft and faintly resilient, like Indian rubber, clearly vegetation. Instantly, Ransom looked up. He saw a pale blue sky, a fine, Winter morning sky, it would have been, on Earth. A great billowy cumulus mass of rose color lower down, which he took for a cloud, and then... Get out! said Weston from behind him. He scrambled through and rose to his feet. The air was cold, but not bitterly so, and it seemed a little rough at the back of his throat. He gazed about him and the very intensity of his desire to take in the new world at a glance defeated itself. He saw nothing but colors, colors that refused to form themselves into things. Moreover, he knew nothing yet well enough to see it. You cannot see things till you know roughly what they are. His first impression was of a bright, pale world, a watercolor world out of a child's paint box. A moment later, he recognized the flat belt of light blue as a sheet of water, or of something like water, which came nearly to his feet. They were on the shore of a lake or river. Now then, said Weston, brushing past him. He turned and saw to his surprise a quite recognizable object in the immediate foreground, a hut of unmistakably terrestrial pattern, though built of strange materials. They're human, he gasped. They build houses? We do, said Divine. Guess again. And, producing a key from his pocket, proceeded to unlock a very ordinary padlock on the door of the hut. With a not very clearly defined feeling of disappointment or relief, Ransom realized that his captors were merely returning to their own camp. They behaved as one might have expected. They walked into the hut, let down the slats which served for windows, sniffed the close air, expressed surprise that they had left it so dirty, and presently re-emerged. We'd better see about the stores, said Weston. Ransom soon found that he was to have little leisure for observation and no opportunity of escape. The monotonous work of transferring food, clothes, weapons, and many unidentifiable packages from the ship to the hut kept him vigorously occupied for the next hour or so, and in the closest contact with his kidnappers. But something he learned. Before anything else, he learned that Malacandra was beautiful and he even reflected how odd it was that this possibility had never entered into his speculations about it. The same peculiar twist of imagination which led him to people the universe with monsters had somehow taught him to expect nothing on a strange planet except rocky desolation, or else a network of nightmare machines. He could not say why, now that he came to think of it, he also discovered that the blue water surrounded them on at least three sides. His view in the fourth direction was blotted out by the vast steel football in which they had come. The hut, in fact, 
was built either on the point of a peninsula or on the end of an island. He also came little by little to the conclusion that the water was not merely blue in certain lights like terrestrial water, but really blue. There was something about its behavior under the gentle breeze which puzzled him, something wrong or unnatural about the waves. For one thing, they were too big for such a wind, but that was not the whole secret. They reminded him somehow of the water that he had seen shooting up under the impact of shells in pictures of naval battles. Then suddenly, realization came to him. They were the wrong shape out of drawing, far too high for their length, too narrow at the base, too steep in the sides. He was reminded of something he had read in one of those modern poets about a sea rising in turreted walls. Catch! shouted Devine. Ransom caught and hurled the parcel on to Weston at the hut door. On one side the water extended a long way, about a quarter of a mile, he thought, but perspective was still difficult in the strange world. On the other side, it was much narrower, not wider than 15 feet perhaps, and seemed to be flowing over a shallow, broken and swirling water that made a softer and more hissing sound than water on earth. And where it washed the hither bank, the pinkish white vegetation went down to the very brink. There was a bubbling and sparkling which suggested effervescence. He tried hard, in such stolen glances as work allowed him, to make out something of the farther shore. A mass of something purple, so huge that he took it for a heather-covered mountain, was his first impression. On the other side, beyond the larger water, there was something of the same kind, but there he could see over the top of it. Beyond were strange, upright shapes of whitish green too jagged and irregular for buildings, too thin and steep for mountains. Beyond and above these again was the rose-colored cloud-like mass. It might really be a cloud, but it was very solid-looking. It did not seem to have moved since he first set eyes on it from the manhole. It looked like the top of a gigantic red cauliflower, or like a huge bowl of red soap suds and it was exquisitely beautiful in tint and shape. Baffled by this, he turned his attention to the nearer shore beyond the shallows. The purple mass looked for a moment like a plump of organ pipes, then like a stack of rows of cloth set up on end, then like a forest of gigantic umbrellas blown inside out. It was in faint motion. Suddenly, his eyes mastered the object. The purple stuff was vegetation. More precisely, it was vegetables. Vegetables about twice the height of English elms, but apparently soft and flimsy. The stalks, one could hardly call them trunks, rose smooth and round and surprisingly thin for about 40 feet. Above that, the huge plants opened into a sheaf-like development not of branches, but of leaves, leaves as large as lifeboats, but nearly transparent. The whole thing corresponded roughly to his idea of a submarine forest. The plants, at once so large and so frail, seemed to need water to support them, and he wondered that they could hang in the air. Lower down, between the stems, he saw the vivid purple twilight mottled with paler sunshine which made up the internal scenery of the wood. Time for lunch, said Devine suddenly. Ransom straightened his back. In spite of the thinness and coldness of the air, his forehead was moist. They had been working hard and he was short of breath. Weston appeared from the door of the hut and muttered something about finishing first. Devine, however, overruled him. A tin of beef and some biscuits were produced, and the men sat down on the various boxes which were still plentifully littered between the spaceship and the hut. Some whiskey, again at Devine's suggestion and against Weston's advice, was poured into the tin cups and mixed with water. The latter, Ransom noticed, was drawn from their own water tins and not from the Blue Lakes. 
As often happens, the cessation of bodily activity drew Ransom's attention to the excitement under which she had been laboring ever since their landing. Eating seemed almost out of the question. Mindful, however, of a possible dash for liberty, he forced himself to eat very much more than usual, and appetite returned as he ate. He devoured all that he could lay hands on, either of food or drink, and the taste of that first meal was ever after associated in his mind with the first unearthly strangeness, never fully recaptured, of the bright, still, sparkling, unintelligible landscape, with needling shapes of pale green thousands of feet high, with sheets of dazzling blue soda water and acres of rose-red soap suds. He was a little afraid that his companions might notice and suspect his new achievements as a trencherman, but their attention was otherwise engaged. Their eyes never ceased roving the landscape. They spoke abstractedly and often changed position and were ever looking over their shoulders. Ransom was just finishing his protracted meal when he saw Divine stiffen like a dog and lay his hand in silence on Weston's shoulder. Both nodded. They rose. Ransom, gulping down the last of his whiskey, rose too. He found himself between his two captors. Both revolvers were out. They were edging him to the shore of the narrow water, and they were looking and pointing across it. At first, he could not see clearly what they were pointing at. There seemed to be some paler and slenderer plants than he had noticed before among the purple ones. He hardly attended to them, for his eyes were busy searching the ground. So obsessed was he with the reptile fears and insect fears of modern imagining. It was the reflections of the new white objects in the water that sent his eyes back to them. Long, streaky white reflections, motionless in the running water. Four or five, no, to be precise, six of them. He looked up. Six white things were standing there, spindly and flimsy things, twice or three times the height of a man. His first idea was that they were images of men, the work of savage artists. He had seen things like them in books of archaeology. But what could they be made of, and how could they stand? So crazily thin and elongated in the leg, so top-heavy, pouted in the chest, such stalky, flexible-looking distortions of earthly bipeds, like something seen in one of those comic mirrors. They were certainly not made of stone or metal, for now they seemed to sway a little as he watched. Now, with a shock that chased the blood from his cheeks, he saw that they were alive, that they were moving, that they were coming at him. He had a momentary, scared glimpse of their faces, thin and unnaturally long, with long, drooping noses and drooping mouths of half-spectral, half-idiotic solemnity. Then he turned wildly to fly and found himself gripped by Divine. Let me go! He cried. Don't be a fool! hissed Divine, offering the muzzle of his pistol. Then, as they struggled, one of the things sent its voice across the water to them, an enormous, horn-like voice far above their heads. They want us to go across, said Weston. Both the men were forcing him to the water's edge. He planted his feet, bent his back and resisted donkey fashion. Now the other two were both in the water, pulling him, and he was still on the land. He found that he was screaming. Suddenly, a second, much louder and less articulate noise broke from the creatures on the far bank. Weston shouted too, relaxed his grip on Ransom, and suddenly fired his revolver, not across the water, but up it. Ransom saw why at the same moment. A line of foam like the track of a torpedo 
was speeding towards them, and in the midst of it, some large, shining beast, Divine shrieked a curse, slipped and collapsed into the water. Ransom saw a snapping jaw between them, and heard the deafening noise of Weston's revolver again and again beside him, and, almost as loud, the clamor of the monsters on the far bank, who seemed to be taking to the water too. He had had no need to make a decision. The moment he was free, he found himself automatically darting behind his captors, then behind the spaceship and on as fast as his legs could carry him into the utterly unknown beyond it. As he rounded the metal sphere, a wild confusion of blue, purple, and red met his eyes. He did not slacken his pace for a moment's inspection. He found himself splashing through water and crying out, not with pain, but with surprise, because the water was warm. In less than a minute, he was climbing out onto dry land again. He was running up a steep incline, and now he was running through purple shadow between the stems of another forest of the huge plants. Your friend and mine, Moon's Cat, is hidden somewhere in this video. Did you see him? If you didn't, it's okay. Go back, watch the video again, write the timestamp that you see him in the comments field, and you get the chance to have the next video dedicated to you or someone you care about. But I will warn you, he does hide pretty well.